Well, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today on the webinar about talking with the pros. And the topic today is going to be RF designs. And today, the we're going to be, Jorge and myself, and we're going to be um, featuring today Joel Morset, which has recently joined the team of Fusion, the Autodesk team, and working with us in Eagle. Uh, Joel, could you tell us just a little bit about you really quick, if you don't mind? Sure. Um, currently a UNF senior UX designer um, working on ECADS uh, with a company that, and as, as Edwin mentioned, recently joined. Prior to that, um, 15 years at Intel doing a whole range of things, board design, comms research in the labs, new business development, um, and decided to, to make a career transition into the design world about four and a half years ago. Um, I've always had a passion for design and wanted to really combine my background with technology, new business innovation, with what I was seeing in the Portland design community. Um, I was tech director at a couple of agencies, including doing user experience research. And then everything sort of got combined with an opportunity to come here and, and work on some software I've been using for a long time, been using Eagle for ages, um, and, and really have, a, have an opportunity to combine my passion for design user experience with, with all those random things I picked up as a, as a system engineer and hardware design development and software and, and everything in between. Um, so, and this is my first webinar. It's, it's exciting to talk it's to a, you. <laughs> thank you very much. I appreciate sure. the information, you know, so yeah. the topic today is about radio frequency and, you know, it's one of those exciting applications to build these days in an electronic designs virtually all uh, up and running technology today, smartphone sensors, robotic security, all of them basically demand um, some level of radio frequency. And some of the factors that need to be considered, some are like impedance, trace lengths, and interface. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing our screen because I actually want to jump over to Joel that he's going to be sharing his screen and giving us some more information about it. So if you Perfect. have any questions throughout the presentation, just go ahead and put them on the chat, and Joel and I will be manning the chats and help you out. Thank you, Joel. I appreciate it. Uh, it's all you now. Great, thanks so much. Um, I, I will start with some introductions slash level set, just so expectations are kind of set. We only have about you know twenty ish minutes on the books. We can always run a little longer. Um, this, as as some of I know you, of you know, this is a very deep well. RF is a very fascinating uh, and and robust corner of engineering and design. Um, so my hope today is to kind of get the ball rolling for folks that may not have done much of this work or have sort of uh, a cursory experience. If you're an RF pro and, you, and you've really got some chops, which I know I saw in the chat, a few of you do, please jump in and both keep me honest and, and share tips, tricks, details, what have you, because that'll definitely make this conversation richer. Um, and while I have some experience, I do not claim to be an RF professional. <laughs> um, I play one on TV. But, um, but I do have enough basics to kind of point you in the right direction and show you um, some, some core concepts so that you're grounded in kind of the fundamentals. And as you go forward um, down this path, as I was saying to Edwin earlier, either know how to do the basics and get the things working that you need or know when to call on the professional. Uh, because some corners of, of doing this kind of design really are, are so domain specific and require a level of expertise that's, um, that's really quite fascinating. Um, so without further ado, um, I kind of want to start and I'm, I'm intentionally, maybe I'll just turn my cam on so you have something to look at. There we go. That's me. Um, so perhaps we'll start with with just some kind of core concepts, best practices, things to keep in mind around radio frequency design, as as Edwin was alluding to, and then we can kind of use that as as guides to the the rest of our discussion. Um, and it's just no in particular, I tried to sort them a little bit last night as I went through, if at all possible, first, if at all possible, use the reference design. Um, some manufacturers that are producing RF chips uh, technology will have better documentation than others. Um, but in, generally, in general, the stuff that's provided in the reference docs has been, has been prototype manufactured and tuned um, by, say, Nordic, for instance. And, and so it's at least in most cases a known good. And if you go to their support folks, you can, you can get some help getting started there and, and then intentionally and carefully diverge from that. Um, we'll talk about this in a second about how to actually set up the circuit and what's in there, but there's an order of operations for getting things 
uh, placed on the board and routed to avoid noise, crosstalk, and, and general pollution from the system. Um, noise, we want to avoid at all costs, as we do in many high-speed designs, but especially in RF. That's going to very quickly um, kill our efficiency, which means range uh, dropouts and you know corrupted data and all kinds of other things. Um, we want to, in general, ground reference everything and, and do it well. So large, the largest floods we can have, we want to tie them together with ground vias. You'll see this in the reference design in a bit to make sure we have a good solid ground plane available underneath all of our signals and then not under our antenna. Again, we'll show this in a second um, because we want the antenna to basically be um, as close to free in the air as possible with the constraint that if it's a PCB trace antenna that we're going to look at, then you're, you know, you're confined to the plane of the board, um, but you can certainly, um, you can certainly leave yourself plenty of space for, um, for being able to get, uh, you know, an omnidirectional antenna and be able to get a nice strong signal. And finally, there's, when it comes to manufacture, and I'll, I'll mention this again, it's like, make sure your fab house knows exactly what your constraints are when you go to get the board fabbed, because this is one of those things that's pretty sensitive to your board tolerances stack up, uh, your board stack up, um, even adding like some fab houses will add like an ID number on your board in an open space somewhere. Uh, put a note if you have to, even in the silk screen um, on the board, like do not put additional copper here in the spaces that need to be cut up for the antenna. Cause that can have an adverse effect on your design. Um, so let's, let's do this. I'm going to share my screen here in a second. And I've, because all this takes time to put together, I'm going to start with a reference design. That's a, that's a known good. Um, I'm going to turn off my cam cause y'all have seen enough of me already. Um, so let's, let's bounce to Eagle. Um, this is the, uh, courtesy of spark fund. This is their NRF, 24L01 chip uh, breakout board. Um, it's a great example because it's 2.45 gig. Um, so it's you know high frequency. It's got all the things you expect to see in an RF design with respect to having your ASIC um, with, um, if we jump out here. Um, so this is the NRF24. This is gonna break out for you know, Arduino or what have you. Um, all the usual suspects. Um, you also notice that there is um, a network here for doing impedance matching. So in general, you can do either single or double-ended antennas because you get these two antenna signals out. Um, we won't go into this detail because it's a very long conversation, but suffice it to say, we want to do a single-ended antenna. That is, you, you have one single feed point um, rather than a differential antenna. Um, so as a result, you add this inductor capacitor network on the output um, on the antenna to do impedance matching. So this, this antenna is basically a 50 ohm feed trace here um, and will appear so and gets normalized going in the ASIC. Um, there's a whole bunch of other reasons for having this network here again, which we won't dig into. Um, but all of this is really the most critical bit of your circuit when it comes to layout. And therefore, you want to start there. You want to ensure that these components are as close to this chip as possible, that the traces are as short as possible. And you want to do things like make sure the traces between them are nice and fat so that you're, you're getting lowest impedance possible um, in your signal path all the way to the antenna. So let's switch, take a look at what the board design is. And just because I'm going to turn a little bit of our, our, there we go. So you can see a little more what's going on. Um, in this particular implementation, and I've left the planes unflooded so you can see them. It's two layer board, um, pretty Joe, standard. Yep. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. We're just seeing the schematic. We're not seeing the board right now. Interesting. Let's try that again. All right, let's do it this way. No, we're good. Yep. Great. Cool. <laughs> so it's not going to auto switch on me this time. Um, so, so this is the layout for the, the board. We see this section here is our matching network um, connected to the antenna. It's the really critical bit that needs to get placed first and laid out. We have a feed line to the antenna. In this case, it's using a chip antenna um, on the top surface of the board. 
um, and the reason we're going to go do a little bit of a redesign on this is chip and tenants can get you up and running. Uh, they're definitely in the category of, we're not sure why it works, but it does. Um, and, and there's plenty of arguments on that. Um, they're, they're fine, but can be flaky. Range cannot be great sometimes and can have a nasty habit of detuning or being sensitive con to conditions. So while this is great for kind of getting you up and running and proving the thing that works, great, and they have their place, um, having a trace antenna or having whip antenna or something a little more robust that can be really tuned is, is often preferable. So what I wanna do with this design is first talk about what you see here and then talk about how to modify it. Um, put a trace antenna down and we'll do it a couple of different ways um, and just show you some basic practices around getting that set up. Um, yes, it's pretty introductory, um, but that'll at least get you started of, of what to look for and, and, and kind of what to expect. Um, if we look at this, you'll notice, um, uh, if we're, we're going to do this and just fill, fill up planes for a second. So you'll see we've got two ground planes, top and bottom, um, set up, but you notice they also stop before the antenna section here at the top. So that the antenna is as close to open air as we can get it. Um, you'll also notice that the flood, these two ground floods are connected with vias as close to gridded and basically everywhere you can possibly fit them. Um, for a couple of reasons. First, you want them nicely coupled. You want lots of ground reference in the design. Second, um, for things like this where you've got little islands, you want to make sure they're connected so that you can place things really, really close. And if your floodplain gets Swiss cheesed on the top, you've got the bottom to kind of save you, right? And you can connect everything together. That way you know you have really robust ground reference. Third, you'll notice these components on the antenna side are placed as close as we can possibly get them to this, this IC. Yes, you'll see there are some violations here because my rules aren't quite 100%, admittedly. Um, I'm going to go back and clean a couple of those up. But, um, and you'll see on this stage, nice fat traces. And in fact, I like to go even fatter and make sure they're the full width of the pads um, between so that, that you've got plenty of copper there to work with. Um, so that's the first step is usually get this antenna stage laid out all the way out to your feed line. Second then is to go look at all of your decoupling, as we always do, right? We wanna make sure decoupling caps are as close to the IC as possible. We also wanna make sure if there's a ground flood plane here, which we see, that there's a nice clean direct path between that and any of your um, decoupling caps, any of your um, vias from your, from your caps so that you have a good clean return path back to the IC, which also helps reduce noise. And, and finally, um, you know, as so we've got everything, uh, as, as closely placed as possible in part because of space constraints on the board also, um, that we have decoupling next to the really critical components like, um, crystal oscillator and that, that sort of thing. Um, so that's, that's kind of the basis of layout. A lot of which is going to sound pretty standard for any, you know, higher speed design. Um, so let's take a look at what it takes to replace this chip antenna and do some some basic uh, some basic layout. But let me um, can you see schematic now? Or are you still seeing the board? Still seeing board. Okay, we're gonna have to just jump back and forth between. That's great. Uh, let me bounce back here. So um, what we want to do is. Uh, there are a couple of steps here to getting um, getting set up. We know this is standard board stack up. Um, so we're just standard board thickness, FR4 core, one ounce copper. Um, we're going to need that information to calculate trace impedance, which is going to matter in a second here for getting our feed line right. Um, we want to have that feed line to the antenna appear at 50 ohms if it's any significant length. Um, because any impedance mismatch, it's expecting to see 50 ohms in the output. So any impedance mismatch is going to cause some attenuation. It's going to cause some signal drop. Um, so it's going to lose some of our range and some of our power. Um, it's not for short feed lines, not super, super, super critical. You can kind of get away with a little fudge factor, but once it gets a little longer, you really want to kind of minimize that, that impedance mismatch. And there's two ways of doing it. Um, either you can make a fatter trace because it's ground reference, which is lower your impedance. Or you can thin the board, which will get your trace closer to the ground plane, which will lower your impedance. And if you notice a lot of the, 
uh, RF antenna boards themselves tend to be really thin. Um, and that's in part because you can really drop that trace impedance down to, to 50 ohms without having to have a huge amount of copper on the board. Um, makes placing around a little bit easier. In this case, we're going to start with a standard thickness board. I will admittedly fudge it a little bit and then we'll talk about how to, to get that cleaned up later um, because the trace will be short enough. It's uh, the guidance I had seen and heard previously and, and our folks, please keep me honest on this, uh, is if you're less than a quarter wavelength trace length, it has less effect than if you're, you're more than that because it has less of a contributing factor. I know there's probably a lot of debate there and if you've got some guidance, uh, please jump in and, and, and drop a note. Um, so let's do the first thing, which is I'm going to start by just removing this antenna entirely. Um, as you saw, that was the chip antenna. So we have just an antenna feed line, essentially. Let's just share my desktop. Then we can bounce among them. Um, so hopefully you can see this now, yeah? Um, going to, or should be seeing layout now, yes? Yes, we do. Cool. Yes, we okay. Do. Yeah, it's, so, better to, it's easier to share the desktop than, than trying to switch every time. Yeah. Painful. Uh, so first thing I'm going to do is just um, expand my board size out, so I've got some space to work with. And you'll you'll note that um, our antenna feed is is here, but doesn't exist anymore. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is, uh, and I can't type and talk. I'm the first one to admit that. So this may be a little stuff. Uh, so I'm going to drop a feed line out, um, and I'm trying to keep it as short as as, as I can. Um, to leave myself some space, but this is our feed out. Um, I'm actually going to make that a little fatter. Um, let's go at, at 32, which should be pretty close to the pad size coming off there. So there's, uh, it's nice and short. So I don't believe this is super, super critical. Next, we want to start building our uh, whip antenna. So we're going to do a trace, sorry, not a whip antenna, a trace antenna. Um, it's basically, you know, a, a run of copper on the surface of the boards. Um, I, for the interest of time, will save the math, but essentially we want a trace that is a, is we're doing a quarter wave antenna, which means you take the wavelength of your signal by one quarter, and that's how long the antenna proper has to be, not including feed line. And in general, you want to leave yourself a little wiggle room there um, to tune the antenna later. Guidance ranges, I'd say plus 20%. If you're a straight antenna and if it's curved, I'd go as much as plus 30 because the curve can, can attenuate your signal and play with it a little bit. Also, copper's cheap. You're already fabbing the board, right? So what I'm going to do here is I, I saved the math um, for the rest of you to see. So let's see. Um, it looks like 27 millimeters is the length we want if we've got an extra 20%, right? Uh, which when converted to inches is 1.06 inches. So we're going to look left in the design manager here. And we're going to watch our trace length as we drop this on the board. Um, the other thing is did some math and um, 60 mil trace is what we need. Make sure I've got my angle set right here. And I'm going to start routing, generally speaking, uh, actually let's do a straight one first uh, to demonstrate that. So um, the first way we can do this is just drop a straight trace. I obviously did not leave myself enough room <laughs> on the board. Um, so let's see, our length is, uh, let's try this. I'm going to give myself a lot more board to work with. Um, so back to running our trace. Uh, we'll drop our antenna on here. What did I say for a length? 1.06, 1. 1. I believe. So cool. So. We'll call that close enough for now um, because it does have the extra 20%. So this is basically straight antenna, um, straight off the feed line. Uh, we can kind of, you know, we can shorten the feed line and I'm gonna redo this in a second. So it's not super critical, right? But you've got a nice, the problem is you've got a long board. The good news is, especially if you mount this in the vertical orientation, you've got, you know, nice clear access to the antenna and lots of space around it. Um, and then as, as an added, so we've dropped copper on the top of the board. If we take a look at what this actually looks like. In a second. Wait a second. It'll get there. It'll get there. It's naked. Still initializing. John is also giving us a tip uh, yep. that and you can also consider an L antenna. That way you don't have to have the straight piece. So Absolutely. Beat me to it. Let's do it. Um, <laughs> you're right ahead of my notes. Uh, 
so let's do this. So yes, um, you could do an L antenna uh, and we'll do an F antenna here in a second. Um, I know it's because you can tell I'm one of those guys that can't type it uses the command line anyway. So points for persistence. Um, so let's do it one more time about routes, right? So as, as mentioned, we can go with an L antenna and save ourselves quite a bit of space. Where is that length? 891. So we can, actually, I went a little long on that one. Um, watch the length on the left here. I guess we'll go maybe this way. Yeah, that should get us about right. One point. And like I said, length isn't super, super critical because what we're going to do is leave ourselves some space to tune this. Um, so then I'll do, the other thing I do want, want to do is shorten the board. And so now if we take a look at this in the manufacturing pane, hook me up. There we go. This is what our board looks like. Um, so you can see, you know, no copper underneath the antenna sitting out there. However, if we want to tune this, that is put it in the enclosure and then test to make sure we've got the right resonant frequency. Everything right now is currently under our solder mask. So what I usually do is just jump out here and in the T-stop layer, I'm just going to, uh, on my fine grid, I'm just going to drop a rectangle. It doesn't have to be huge. Um, leave myself enough space over the end. So when we go to manufacture it, we'll have a section of exposed copper. Um, then you can get in there with the X-Acto knife, honestly, and just scratch the end off, right? And remove copper until you've gotten this down to the right length and, and you're getting the kind of signal you need. Um, Spectrum analyzer is involved. Um, you can kind of do it experimentally if you've got a few of them and want to play with it. It's kind of the, the, the quick and dirty way to do it. It's frankly not broken because uh, you have a basic idea what that length should be. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it for um, getting this particular style of antenna. There's multiple ways of, of shaping this. General guidance from the spec sheet for this part is make sure that you're at least 10 millimeters from the end of the antenna and the ground plane. As you get closer and closer to the ground plane, it also attenuates your signal. Um, so you're making a compromise, but it's not terrible and you're saving some board space. Um, so that's where we are here. So now let's, let's back this all out. And I wanna just get us back to where we started. There we go. All right, so back where we started. I'm gonna jump over here and now I'm going to place, so you can, uh, let me up level for a second. So you can do that antenna, you can get it tuned. And once you get your design to the point where you want to have it, um, you can then either copy paste or you can make a component that has that antenna in it for reuse. Um, and that's sort of the, the best way to, to reuse what you've got. I'm gonna jump in here um, and actually, grab another component that already exists, which is a grounded trace antenna. It's, it's a variation of that theme. And as you can imagine, there's no shortage of complexity that we can add to this process. It's a pretty standard antenna for the 2.45 gig range, you know, Bluetooth and Zigbee and, and all of that. Time proven, you'll see it on a ton of, of designs, including the ones from SparkFun. Um, but basically there's a feed line that goes in and there's a ground trace that comes back. Um, and now if we take a look here, we've got a new component to place um, and they are kind enough in their design to give us um, a couple of pieces of guidance as to where it actually has to be uh, located on the board so as to um, work with it. There we go. Um, to get the results that we want. I'm going to do it this way, which is you see there's a board edge and there's a ground plane edge marking. I'm gonna go with the board edge marking and then we're gonna to have to actually uh, modify our ground planes a bit um, to accommodate. So now you see that we have antennas on the boards. Uh, once again, we'll have a feed line going in, so keeping it pretty short. Um, there's a lot we could do to tune this design and really optimize. I can speak to some of that, but in the interest of time, we'll, we'll kind of keep it simple. Um, there's two things that needs to happen here. Obviously we have to connect our feed line. Also we have to connect our ground plane. And the way we want to connect our ground plane is through a trace to a via and leave that end um, pretty isolated. So it has the ground connection, but the antenna per se is not uh, overly encumbered by, by the ground plane itself. So to do this, uh, first thing I'm going to do here is grab my two ground planes um, and I'm just going to pull them up to the line. Um, 
And as I recall, that is an outer like this. Um, and notice there's one on the bottom as well. Um, so we want to make sure both top and bottom are matched. Um, so now if we rat's nest, we'll notice, great. So we've got ground planes all the way up to the antenna. But we, the problem we have on the top layer is our ground plane is now fully connected to the end, end of the antenna. Um, so what I'm going to do is go back and modify that shape uh, with a split command. Um, I would say generally, um, oops. Left click again. When, when Thank you. you the, um, <laughs> Let's do it again. Thanks. I think I got out of my command. There we go. So split, and I actually want right angle corners, and we want to start here. There you go. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and and like I said, it's not super super critical where this channel is and its geometry. We just need to kind of, you know, uh, break around the ground signal. I could probably actually do that a little closer, and it wouldn't be terrible. Um, there we go. So here we go. We just need enough clearance where it's isolated. There we go. Um, so now if we do that, now I've got the plane flood both, you know, uh, outside the antenna line and, and outside the ground plane. I'm going to move. We've got this um, grid via here. I'm just going to grab that um, and, and give ourselves another because we want another row of grid vias uh, between ground planes. And generally, you want to keep them pretty dense close to the edges, especially the edges close to the antenna tends to really help with, with attenuation. Um, so we'll do the ground trace first. I'm just gonna move this guy over here a bit. And, and it's probably close enough given my grid density. Um, and then we're gonna route. Uh, in this case, it doesn't necessarily need to be a super fat trace. Um, we're at 32, it should be, actually it's a little fatter than I want. Let's go 16. Um, there we go. Um, to that via. So now we're connected to the via. Uh, you notice I'm not using thermals in any of these vias. I want a good fat connection um, between the plane and the via itself. And finally we have our antenna feed line here. So this is, this is the aside. We generally speaking want to A, keep this trace really, really short, and B, want to make sure that this trace um, is 50 ohms impedance. Um, in order to do that, if you run the calculations of the board thickness, that's a 104 mil trace, which is really, really fat. We can do that, it's fine. Um, or we can, frankly, cheat a little bit, and we can go with um, a 32 mil trace because it's pretty short and we're well under the quarter wavelength uh, size is the antenna. Um, we'll have, yes, arguably some attenuation over what a 100 mil trace was, um, but it's not, it's not so much that it'd be a massive, I mean, this gives you an idea of how much a 100 mil trace is, right? It's, it's basically this copper flood. So um, what I'm gonna do in this case is um, run it at 32 from here. And turn this back on, um, out to my antenna. And this is my own fault for setting my grid too fat. There we go. <laughs> Hang on just a second, I'm gonna set my grid settings. I'm gonna go five mils or this is gonna be very, very tedious. Uh, that's better. So back to 32 mils, we got the angle set. Uh, I'm gonna bounce off of here. Um, and it's going, it's going to complain about having um, sorry. It's gonna complain about having shapes overlaid. Um, known issue because of the way the, the end of this antenna is built, um, which is fine. Um, and you can just manually override that. Um, it's it's a known for this component. It's not unusual for, for doing shapes like this with the antenna. So we got a nice fat trace coming out here. That'll lower our impedance. Um, cuts out the ground plane. Voila, uh, is placed. Um, if you want to play with it a little bit for optimization, I know we're kind of you know going down a deep well here, but 
you could arguably play with this placement a little bit, rotate these components, slide them over, bring everything down, and then your antenna trace is even shorter. It's probably a negligible issue here, um, but if you find that you're having problems um, and you're losing a lot of signal, that's one thing to look at. Um, and the other thing, of course, is that I want to jump in here um, and in my T-stop layer, you know, I want to grab the end of the antenna and leave myself some copper, exposed copper to play with. You could also run this antenna a little bit longer, but as I recall, um, this is already designed with you know, 10 or 15% on the end. Um, it'll catch up with us in a second here. Um, so that's where we are with this. Um, also, adding two things, and we've, we've got a few minutes. Um, it may also be handy to double down and have UFL connector run here so that you can put, alternately put a whip antenna. So if you want to try that, or if you want to actually just read the signal with a spectrum analyzer while you're doing your testing, it's also good to have that. If you want to place that uh, as close as you can to the output stage of this um, antenna feed here. Also, typically throw a couple zero ohm resistors in line with the antenna trace and the UFL trace. Um, so that they can be isolated, especially if you're using UFL with a whip antenna, you want to disable the other antenna that's on there. Um, and we basically do that. Um, if we want to drop that in here, excuse me, we're going to leave this. Basically, and this is going to get ugly because we're doing this, uh, doing this quickly, but uh, there we go. It's, it keeps switching because apparently uh, Eagle wants to make my mouse disappear because I'm screen sharing, <laughs> which is actually probably not even an Eagle thing, to be honest with you. Um, and let's see. All right, so we're going to break that trace, uh, break that signal connection here, and we're going to sneak our UFL inboard of this because we want to be on basically the outboard side of the caps and I'm going to jump over real quick to my dock because I had a little snap here at the bottom right so basically you want to have your UFL inboard of your isolation but outside of the capacitors so that you're on the um, on the business end of this this matching network uh, I'm going to put a couple things in here um, I'm going to drop a couple of resistors um, just a little okay. little opportunity for for a, a neat trick that you can do if yeah. you have a, a net that runs that full length if you put a resistor in the middle of it eagle will automatically yeah. snap it out so you don't have to fantastic yeah um so here's going to be our our two uh, resistors that we'll put in line for isolating the antenna, isolating the UFL connector. We're also going to drop a UFL connector in here, and which we had. Hmm. There we go. Um, surface mount UFL, which will drop right in here. Um, and now we're just going to do a copy of this, uh, ground those pins out. And now for the magic, not so much. Um, yes. Like I said, it exists. It doesn't have to be pretty right now. All right, so here we are. Now if we go back, um, you'll notice we've got our, as soon as I get down there, and if I remembered right, I did a 402. Yeah, good. I was doing this last night and managed to grab the wrong size resistor and, and, and it made quite a mess. Um, so here's our UFL connector. I'll just place it over there for now. Um, our couple of resistors that we need to drop in uh, for our inline connection. Grab this guy over here. And in the interest of time, I don't think I have to jam through all this, but basically, um, 
I'll get everything roughly placed so you get an idea, right? We've got plenty of real estate over here in this, this area of the copper flood. So I can move my vias around, give myself some space, right? Drop my UFL connector because we do want to have a ground plane underneath it. Um, and once again, we want to place everything as close as we possibly can to minimize any impedance and mismatch and potential noise um, that we incur from having, frankly, more components on the board, right? And having um, each of these places here. Uh, and I'm going with fat traces again, right? I want to be pretty close to the pad size when I do it. So there's one. Um, and you see that we're, we're nice and grounded. We're going to run our feed line across here. There. So now we've got a UFL with a zero, and we can stuff, unstuff. Um, ditto on the antenna line here, right? So let's, let's go ahead and route that. And I'm, once again, going to stick a prefat trace. Yes, thank you. I mistyped. Um, I'm going to stick a pretty fat traces um, to minimize um, any impedance mismatches, and we're going to place everything as close as we possibly can. Um, oops. This will be the last. Glad you're recording all my mistypes. I think that's that's also you know, part of the <laughs> part of the funny. Uh, here we go. There we go. So. Um, so now we've got UFL connector and antenna on the board, mix and match, um, can probably tighten that up a little bit admittedly, right. And keep some of our traces a little shorter. Um, but, but the idea is basically there at this point, uh, I'm going to take a breather. I'm sure there are probably questions, feedback. Um, if any of the folks want to jump in with, with other tips, tricks, and concerns, that would be fantastic as well. So John mentioned that you can use a, a program called Easy Neck. It's one of the, like ham, it's like a ham software. Mm -hmm. You can use it to simulate the radiation pattern and what input impedance you need to have to match the circuit. Fantastic. Good to know. Thank you. Yeah. And then Richard asked, what was the name of the connector for the whip? And I think that's UFL. That's what I responded. Yep. yep. U.FL. Uh-huh. Okay. And then we're just going to go here. So, there I we go. I wanted to mention that, um, that the library you're using is the SparkFun library, and you could access yep. that library from within Eagle Manage Libraries. Yep. Just go to the Manage Library section, and you're going to see a many or maybe all of the SparkFun libraries. Now, if you're using a, ver a legacy version of Eagle that does not have the Manage Library system embedded yet, then you could just go to the SparkFun site and download those libraries. They usually have them av easily available yep. as well. Exactly. And there's, uh, there's also a, a ton of others out there. And so I've, I stumbled across a couple of good RF labs last night with, with myriad antennas in them. Um, and as I alluded to, this is a very deep well, right? So um, you have the opportunity to go out and um, experiment to your heart's content or with various antenna styles, um, technologies and that sort of thing. Um, and it's pretty easy to actually build a board with a whole raft of antennas on it um, with the UFL connector off that you can then go down to your baseboard, right? And, and test all of them and experiment to your heart's content and see what the changes are. Especially if you have a lab that's in, in, instrumented up to really get good measurements, um, it can be a pretty fruitful process. So if you just take a look here, right, we've got our copper exposed so we can tune it. I dropped a bunch of other vias on, um, you can almost not have too many, as long as you, as long as you've got copper, uh, still got copper underneath. You'll see on on some reference designs it gets really, really dense around the edges. I don't know if it's super critical in this one to be honest that it would matter, but you can always, um, you know, you can sort of like this double down on the on the edges, right? The edges of your ground planes, especially up here, uh, where you're close to the antenna. Um, you want to make sure you have a nice solid connection. Um, that kind of business, right? Okay, so we have a few questions. Sure. Um, if you have any recommendation for a surface mount antenna that would be good for the TICC 3220 and where to keep, where to put it, if there's any more guidance on that. I, I don't personally, I'll defer to anybody in the channel that might have had some experience. Um, yeah, I haven't yeah. used that, that, that uh -huh. part. That's an integrated microcontroller and, and yeah. uh, Wi-Fi module if memory serves. Yeah, that sounds right. 
Yeah, I don't I, have any experience with it either. Yeah, and, and like I said about data sheets, sometimes you get great guidance from the data sheets, and sometimes you don't. Um, and I can't remember what TI typically does in the ref designs if they go with chip antenna or not. So it's it's a great question. Okay. And, and frankly, it might be a great point to just reach out to TI and establish a relationship. I mean, they've got app engineers will probably get you there faster than anybody because they've got some some tried and true stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Um, we have uh, John Smith is asking where we can find such libraries. I, I don't know if John, you're asking about the Spark Fund. If you're asking about those, those you can access from the library manager in the newer versions of Eagle. And you'll find it under the available tab. You'll see all the SparkFun libraries there. Um, how about adding an SMA connector for omnidirectional antennas? Yes. Uh, process is going to be pretty similar to what you just saw. Um, I mean, if you'll excuse me for just a second, as you'll probably see in the screen share, my battery's just about cooked, so I'm going to plug myself in here. Uh, <laughs> We're doing all the things and it's basically taking all the power. There, power anxiety alleviated. Uh, well, let's take a quick quick look. You said SMA connector, yeah? Um, mm -hmm. We're flying without a net, so let's give this a shot and see if I can find one quick. Um, connector coax, yeah. We want, it's gonna have to be one of these probably, right? As uh, a vertical PCB through hole. Roll check. You know, man, like, there we go. That, the, that library is um, just for John's information. That library ships mm -hmm. with Eagle. The Con Coax is mm -hmm. one of the ones that ships with Eagle. Yep. Um, I don't know. Let's pick. Is this a surface mount as opposed to the through hole? Then we're a little tight on space. But let's try. Well, what the heck? Let's let's do it. Right. Let's do the through hole jack. Only because um, it'll actually end up saving us a little space because it'll it'll be nice and tight to uh, the ground planes underneath because it is a through hole component. Um, and let's do this. I'm totally going to cheat, and we're going to we're going to pull out this one, and we're gonna just going to do a replace. <laughs> um, we're not lazy; we're efficient. Remember that. Um, so signal goes here. Ground goes there. It's going to basically look the same, right? Except it's going to be huge. Um, so the caveat I'm going to add to this one, let me see how much. Yeah, it's really big. So what I'm going to do, we'll do this quick and, and, and you get the basic gist of it. Um, there's kind of a two-step that you need to do here, right? Obviously, you need more board space. And when I kind of was playing around with these a couple of days ago, I think I ended like, I basically ended up moving the antenna far left and dropping the, the connector far right, um, which is fine because your antenna is still going to be open air and it'll have plenty of space. So I kind of, I can't give you the vibe of what we're going to do on this, right? Um, it's having no part of me grabbing the edge of that plane. Um, let's do... Yeah, sometimes it's better if you rip it up. Uh, that way yeah. you see it. Yeah, there you go. Totally. Sometimes I can grab the edge, sometimes I can't. So first thing we're going to do is is one of these, right? Send our ground plane out. I'm going to drop this guy over here. It's, like I said, it's quick and dirty, right? We're just going to make it work. Um, and second is you want to make sure that you have ground plane underneath here um, so that, that gets referenced, right? So we're going to do this again. Our old friend. Again, corners, corners are critical. Um, yeah, we'll do it that way. All right, Jorge, help me out, man. How do I get the right corner on here? <laughs> so you're just trying to get an extra corner in there? There it is. You got it. Matters which side of the line I, I drag it on. Uh, there we go. All right, so basically, uh, yeah, bottom's gonna look like a top, right? Um, but essentially we want to, you know, move our ground plane out. So we're fully ground referenced underneath. Doink. Uh, and now we've got our signal trace. We route our signal trace back. Um, I'll beg for forgiveness from the folks that are currently on the bridge of what I'm about to do, <laughs> but you get the idea, right? You, know, uh, you want to make that trace as short as possible. Yes. I've got fias in the way. All that kind of thing. 
uh, make that trace as short as possible. Um, sometimes I've cheated and, and run this like on a 45, right? So I can have a nice, nice short trace back to the network. Um, and like I said, you can play with your, your board placement a little bit. Um, again, you want as much space around this antenna as you possibly can for this style of antenna. As I recall this board edge, it's, it's not unidirectional, but you definitely get a better signal off sort of the end plane of the board. Um, so having this over here will probably attenuate, but not a huge deal. Also, I made enough space in the board. I can probably just, you know, move this guy down now, right? So for, for you to play with. Um, but I think you kind of get the concept, right? Which is, you'll probably get away with something like this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then you can move your ground plane back. And now it's, it's, yes, there's some experimentation and kind of some trial and error involved there. Okay. We had a, a question if you could have multiple antennas, like a, a surface mount and a through hole. For sure. Uh, as I mentioned before, you want to run one at a time, which is why I've got the zero ohm resistors. There's no stuff options in there. Um, and that's it's pretty standard. If you're running one antenna, you don't want the other because, um, because frankly, well, it, you've got two antennas running, right? Um, there are some... They'll, they'll, be, they'll be in parallel, so your impedance is going to be off by half. Ex exactly. You're, it's in parallel, your impedance is off by half. You've got two antennas um that you're now receiving and dealing with and you kind of get a mess um there are some asics that have you know multiple you have the ability to draw multiple antennas and you can switch the software switch the firmware which is nice uh but in general it's a one at a time kind of thing um ex the and as i alluded to before if you've got the ufl connector on here or you've got this sma connector and you're doing it with your spectrum analyzer go ahead and run both because you're reading off of it and you're not using it as an antenna um and the spectrum as their play is nice and it's, you know, super high impedance input. So it's not going to appear, it's not going to load and, and cause impedance problems. Okay. So we have that. Um, why all the vias? I think you answered that earlier. It's basically just to make a really, really solid connection to, gr to the ground planes. You want them exactly. both to have really low impedance. So by Swiss cheesing them in a way, yep. basically make sure that wherever a wave might hit the ground plane, it has a really direct path. To, to a solid ground connection, to a solid return. Absolutely, exactly it. Solid return is, is the key. And if you'll notice, my top is top layer is kind of a mess, right? So having these vias, and if we just take a look at, um, I guess I'll do it this way. Not the one I wanted, that one. <laughs> just switch and, to the bottom. Oh, okay. There you go. And do it this, then we're right side up ish. <laughs> right. Uh, and take a look at what we've got on the bottom now. Um, ton of copper, right? And, and plenty of return paths. Uh, makes everybody happy. Um, yep. Just want to let you know that it, uh, you can manually place the vias and name them with the same name as the polygon, okay? It's really easy. Um, and they used to get all, you know, the default value is that polygons will be swallowed by the, by the, um, by the polygons. They don't, they do not get the thermals by default. Okay? Exactly. You have to set that up. Okay. Just want to bring that up real quick. Yeah. Great point. Thank you. Um, so I just did that, dropped a new via in here, right? And so once we go do one of those, yes, we do one of those, good to go. And no thermal reliefs. Mm -hmm. If you see a little ring around the via, it means it's not connected. It's to give you a reference. Yes, right, 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 right. <laughs> yeah. Great point. Thank you. Uh, okay. Like that. That's there not you go. That's <laughs> Yeah, that. that's not connected. Yeah, right. That's, so that's just a hole. One, the plated one. hole on the board. <laughs> so we have a question. What's recommended inductor value when designing 3 to 5 volt amplifier for a 1575 megahertz active GPS antenna? That's going to depend on what your capacitor is which the capacitors in that in yep. that impedance matching exactly. network are because you're looking for resonance at that frequency. That's really the, the, the key point. So you have more flexibility in choosing capacitors than you do inductors because of the way, you know, physics works, the geometry of inductors and things like that. So they aren't available in as many values as caps maybe. So what you'll probably want to do in that situation, since the, the capacitor has more leeway in its value selection, is you'll pick you know, some value for inductance and then uh, the appropriate capacitors. You always have to take into account any parasitics that mm -hmm. the inductor may have, any parasitic capacitances, since that will affect your, the other capacitors that will make up the impedance matching network. 
Um, but you know, without more info, that's basically the gist of it. The value of the inductor is dependent on what capacitors you use because you're looking for resonance at that 1575 megahertz. And then last one, they gave us a picture. Oh yeah? Yeah, they gave us a picture. I'm trying to set up several antennas on one PCB for all directions, following a reference design made by TI, the DN023, mm -hmm. using an RF power monitor. Would appreciate any guidance. The antennas I'm making are in a library now, so they are work in progress. Okay. Does this look like I'm on the right track? Oh, so cool, so you found it. Oh, right on. Yeah, I'm with you. Okay, cool. See what you got. Um, I'm doing the quick scan here. I think so. Let me zoom in a little bit here. John, if you're if you're still on yeah. here, you can you can feel free to weigh in also. Since you Please are, do. Oh. But yeah, um, yeah, exactly. So I I would if I made and, and please anybody jump in if I would were to make a couple of tiny, tiny adjustments. As I mentioned before, um, it's cool that you got the matching network out here close to itself, close to the connector, close to the antenna. But in general, you can get away with a longer feed line. It's if given the choice, right? You'd want to have this matching network as close to the tiny as possible with a longer feed line to the whip antenna versus the other because you potentially pay more of a cost in terms of attenuation and noise and all that by having long traces out of your antenna lines here, right? So you want to keep that nice and short. Um, but just looking at the board, I mean, you got lots of real estate. So you might be able to get away with even, you know, there's no reason you can't flip this antenna around and, and work out of this corner, right? And get things like really, really tight. But I definitely defer to the experts in the room for, for finer guidance on that. Mm -hmm. John mentions that the inductors should be at right angles to each other to minimize coupling. Yes, thank you. Good catch. Yep. You notice that's the case here. Yep. You can get a, a capacitor orientation. You can you can get away with a lot, but inductors. Yep, that's absolutely true. Okay, I'm not seeing anything else. Is a... He's asking: Is there a preferred? Uh, Board thickness for RF. That that depends, I guess, on what you're transmitting. You know, it depends on, on the so, frequency you're dealing with. For sure. So let me give you a two-part answer on that one, which is, uh, and let's jump for those that are not familiar with doing this calculation. Let's talk for just a second about microstrip, right? Microstrip impedance, which probably most of us or all of us have familiarity with, basically, to get, so I mentioned RF boards can be really thin, typically, um, at least for for the antenna part, and you know. The, the output stage. Um, you can use a standard thickness board, and you'll notice if you do a standard thickness board and, a, and a, let's go to 16 mil trace, right? Just, um, get you 122 ohm trace. Or sorry, 122 ohm impedance on that trace, which means if you're going to have a standard thickness board, your feed line, uh, let's see if I can, yeah, pretty close, right? 105 somewhere in there, let's call it 110, right? 110 mils gets you kind of sorted of to 50 ohms, probably close enough for, for jazz, right? Um, even 120, that's a, it's a fat trace. It's not a huge deal, as I mentioned before, if it's, if it's really short, you can get away with a lot. So the other way that you can modulate this, right, is I can either make a fatter trace, so you know, essentially more electrons can go through it, or I can reduce my substrate thickness down to, you know, I go half gets me an I6, um, push it in on thickness if I go down here, but you know, I can go with a thin board, slightly wider trace, gets you generally in the neighborhood using one ounce copper, right? Gets you in the neighborhood of, of 50 ohms. So that's the game you play. And depending on your fab house and how you want to do this, you can get thinner board, narrower trace, or thicker board, fatter trace. Um, in general, if I remember right, a 50 ohm trace is going to be twice your, your board thickness if you have a two-layer board. Excuse me. It's going to be twice the distance between your uh, trace and the reference ground plane, which in the case of a two-layer board is your board thickness through FR4. So if you use that as a rule of thumb, right, and this is, you know, substrate heights 16 and the trace width's 32, so that bears out. Um, just for fun, but check the math. Let's see if, you know, 
I mean, right? Not too far, right? So basically, it's it's a it's two to one relationship. Get you there. Mm -hmm. And you'll also notice, keep me honest, RF folks, this won't have an impact on your antenna because your antenna is not ground referenced. It's basically floating out on naked FR4 with no copper below it, right? So uh, all the work that's been done to get the antenna uh, trace width right and bend and corners and all things is generally speaking unencumbered by the changes you're gonna make in the board thickness. It has much more to do with how close you are to the ground plane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a couple right. of users are, are jumping in. They're saying uh, one option is if you have a multi-layer PCB and you make yep. the, the, sec the closest inner layer ground, then obviously the, that height changes so yes. you can get thinner traces. Yep. And then John is adding that board thickness would be driven by the desired radiation pattern. Yes. Thank you. Absolutely. We have a and we have we have a very subjective question here. Do you really need a spectrum analyzer? Ha! <laughs> no. Uh, you, you never yeah. could have enough tools, man. <laughs> man, you can never have enough. Well, right. Exactly. Uh, yes, they're expensive. Yes, you can rent them. And if you're going after like consumer products especially if you need UL rating or any of that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. You need to get, at least get in a lab with a spectrum analyzer to, to do the work. I would say at least in this frequency range, because um, core wavelength is pretty long, you can get away with just kind of experimentally twiddling the end of the trace until you, you know, get where you need to be. And if you go too far, you do it on your next board and do a run of four or five and you're probably there. I would say if you're running at higher frequencies, things get more and more touchy. Uh, technical term, um, and and all of those values lay out, all that business is gonna have more of an impact in your signal noise ratio, um, and therefore the value of having some some good kit is, is gonna really have an impact. But I would say at this, uh, you can probably get, the, you can probably get there without it. Okay. But we you can never it. have too many toys. <laughs> That's true. We have a question if anybody has any recommendations about books uh, that deal specifically with RF routing techniques and circuitry. Any book recommendations? Great question. Don't use the outer router. That's not a book. <laughs> <laughs> that should have been my, my first piece of guidance. Don't use the outer router. Yes, that, that is true. Definitely not to use the outer router. Um, there's a, there's a few good signal integrity books, but they're not directly yeah. dealing with RF. Yeah. Um, let me let me check something. I do have there's signal integrity simplified, which I which I have. Mm -hmm. that, one, that one is really good. I do I do recommend that one. Um, and, but that's good PCB high frequency routing in general, so it would still apply. Um, I think. The the uh, the Bible per se of, of that field is high speed design, black magic, something like that. Yep. You yep. get the right uh, the right title. High speed digital design, a handbook of black magic. That's considered the heavy duty uh, lingua franca of of this type of routing and yep. of this type of design. Um, but I liked I liked the one of signal integrity simplified. That one was really nice and very practical. So recommend those two. Uh, I'll see if I can get in links. Cool. John has a recommendation there, I think. Um, for her. I was waiting for John to jump in. Yeah. He there we had, go. Let's yeah. listen to John. John's got this. We listen yeah, to John. John. <laughs> yeah, John is good. <laughs> RF Circuit Design by Christopher Bowick, Cheryl Ajluni, and John Byler. So nice. we're gonna we're gonna defer to John on this. So cool. let me find the links and I'll I'll post them up. Right on. And and right. I'll, I'll I'll also say this, which is like uh, clearly I'm not anything close to an RF guru, and anything I know. I learned firsthand by watching over somebody's shoulder and there's, there's no substitute if you have access to somebody who really knows this stuff um, to spend some time with them in the lab, spend some time with them doing design. Um, it's one of those, or it's, it's as much <laughs> very jokes about it being a dark art, but it's as much tradition and sort of an intuitive sense for the folks that are really good at it as it is any science and math behind it. Um, and that takes time. 
Um, so, so working with somebody that really, really knows how to do this and has that intuitive sense of how to tune a circuit, how to tune an antenna, how to, you know, the tips and tricks and all the little stuff um, is invaluable. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Greatly appreciate it. Everybody, have a great day. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Joel. Sure thing. Talk to you later, guys.